and all right and with that we are live and uh today we are actually going to be uh discussing the do we do we really want to call what just happened between dr carrier and uh sj thomas in a conversation or do we want to call that what it actually was i mean it was a slaughter but yeah that's probably a lot more accurate you know, it was not uh it, it did it was not even handed <laughs> no I, I really can't call what happened a conversation because typically a conversation uh, involves having two people that are discussing something and what we witnessed there was not that. That was that was something completely different. <laughs> well, you know, they've been trying to have this discussion for a while and we were going to arrange it originally on the non sequitur show, but um, Godless uh, Cranium and, and Shannon, Shannon Q got it. It was just fine. Um, so I was really looking forward to having uh, that discussion or listening to that discussion. It didn't go anywhere where I thought it was going to go, and it had really nothing of the hallmark what I would be to say that it was a discussion because it was basically SJ not understanding what the topic was. It, it was Richard Carrier asking questions she was ill-equipped to answer. Uh, she ran a script more than anything else. She's on his autopilot where she's just basically re regurgitating things that she wants to get out as talking points rather than actually engaging in the conversation. And I've seen SJ do that before, and I like SJ. I mean, I consider SJ a friend. This is constructive criticism to her, but she does this frequently. Her apologetics are the worst apologetics out there with the exception of maybe the white engine. And so yeah. I, I, just, I, I, I was really kind of disappointed because I really Ouch. thought that she would probably... <laughs> <laughs> God, that hurt. Yeah. That's bad. <laughs> um, you don't agree? You think? I mean, no, I agree. But I, okay. it, uh, that's, I don't know. I think that she, there's, there's, there's other people in between. <laughs> not not, not <laughs> many. Point engine, I think. Not, not, a lot not, of them. Are, not, lot, not when it, not when it comes to stuff like that. When you've, when you have a conversation like what happened there. Uh, there's, there's a line that she uses a lot, which is, "I'm really glad, I'm really glad you brought that up." But then she digs herself into a hole, and I'm, and Steve, I'm on the same page as you. I consider myself. I don't. I don't know if I consider myself a friend with SJ because that would involve her reciprocating that. Um, but I do consider her at least somebody who I am acquainted with and will speak on. And I've been on her channel before, and I'd be glad to do it again. Um, so I think it is a matter of constructive criticism that there are some issues that just need to be sussed out in how she argument or in how she she argues. Because when she argues, she takes this position, it, essentially, uh, God is on my side, therefore I'm right, uh, by fiat. And that's, I don't think that's a really good way to go about it, but that's pretty much how she goes about it every time. Like, I think there was one part in the conversation with her and Carrier where she said, well, the Bible says that only Jesus lived a sinless, sinless life, so I can only assume that Buddha and Gandhi had some problems in their lives, so they can't be a perfect objective moral standard. Like, wait, what? <laughs> well, I think I think the problem even goes a little more deeper than that. When he had asked her, how do you know that Jesus is the objective moral standard? Now, you have to realize that, that both SJ I and Richard agree with agree that uh, objective morality exists. What, Ocean? I, I, I thought that she would have a response for that. She didn't, though, and that's, and that's the thing. She didn't have a response yeah. to that very pertinent question, how do you know that that is what that objective standard is that you're appealing to? Now, again, they both agree objective morality exists, um, and I, I think that Lucifer Almighty, who is in, was in the live chat during that discussion, what that who is a friend of mine, he, he hit it on the, head, on the head, now, and he again, said, look, it, it, I think it's best just to concede for these types of uh, discussions, objective morality is a thing. I, I'm cool with that. I actually agree with that, even from an error of theorist point of view. Um, it's not worth the hassle to get in the nuances of objective morality exists or doesn't exist. Just concede for arguendo that it exists. Because the real point is, how do you know what's objective? That's the whole point of the, the problem of, of objective morality is if it exists, which I do think it does, how do we know epistemically what are the moral facts? How do we, how do we know, how do we have access to that information? Right, and that's what she he was asking her, and I don't even know how to regurgitate her answer. Yeah, I was I I, I mean I like her too, uh, SJ I, I I do, but I I, th I think also I agree with the two of you that I was a little I was annoyed because I wanted her to do better than she did, um, and I think that there because I think there's a lot of responses 
to what Carrier had to say, uh, even from a like Christian theist perspective. I think that she didn't do a very good job defending Christian theism against what Carrier had to say, because there are justifications for it. You can, yes, like she, sure. there, there are answers to the questions that uh, Carrier had to say. I think that Carrier's strongest point, though, was when he started going after her about slavery. Yes. And he was saying, well, if, if slavery is objectively wrong, why didn't Jesus have anything to say about it when he was surrounded by slavery? And then SJ's immediate response was not to give a justification, but to retreat to cultural relativism immediately. And bizarre. Bizarre as hell. And Gallus Island tweeted that out. He caught that. A lot of people caught that. How, how do you try to justify objective morality by giving a cultural relativism uh, type of argument? That then you're appealing to subjectivism to justify objectivism. It's giving points to the other side in an attempt to have points on your side, but it doesn't work that way. Well, I don't think you necessarily have to, to appeal to subjectivism. I mean, her her thing was she was dealing with with cultures, and that that, that goes to more to like descriptive, more relativism, mm. right? Because subjectivism would be the individual. So if she was appealing to like, oh, well, this one person believes this, then she would be appealing to to subjectivity, uh, subjectivism. But she's not. She's saying that certain cultures have morals, um, and that how do we determine that those morals are, are good or bad, right? And that's a legit argument. There's called descriptive moral relativism. But the thing is, is what she's not understanding, and I think Richard pointed it out very succinctly, well, the argument would be just those cultures are wrong. It's simple. Hitler was wrong. Nazis are wrong. They're evil. They're they're bad. You can make these types of claims even if you are objective of uh, objective moralists. You're just saying that those things are true independently of what anybody believes. So if somebody believes differently, the argument is, well, well you're just wrong about it. Okay, fair enough. That's, but she doesn't think you can have that. She, I, I don't get her. I don't understand how she keeps relating or trying to conflate objective morality with, with cultural relativism. I really don't either. It's confusing to me because it's it, it's it's not... It's not arguing for your side when you're trying desperately to argue for your side. And it's confusing to me. It's just like when she uses the uh when she uses the apologetic of the apostles dying, not even understanding that by using that apologetic, you're basically giving points to every other religion at the same time when you're trying yes. to swing only for yours. That that's invoking Again, a, a kind of a relativistic type thing. Well, these people died in the name of their beliefs. Well, so did other people. That doesn't make their belief objective. Yeah, that, that works for my religion. Exactly. I don't use that argument because because it's a bad um, argument. Like as far as like, yeah, it doesn't it doesn't work very well. It's a bad argument, but I could use it. You know, <laughs> not, but, for object, not for an objective standard. I don't think. How, how would you for an objective standard? No, what I'm saying is that I could I could use it the way that she's using it. Oh, sure, it would it would be bad, but you could. Sure. Right, it wouldn't. It's but it it applies. It would be just as effective for you to use it as it would be for her. Right, right. No matter how no matter that's how relativism. well that no matter how well that works, that's a different question. But right, I don't think it would work well. very well. But I could use it. it this, well, uh, what she's saying applies to a lot of different polytheistic faiths. Sure, but so, uh, I mean, I, I can't give away the convo. But I mean, I was talking to Richard. I was talking, telling you because I was talking to Richard Carrier about this after the discussion, um, and um, we, me and Richard are on the same page. Uh, definitely on the same page. And we, one thing I can definitely say is that SJ just doesn't know much about these topics because she doesn't want to know about these topics. I, I don't know if she's ever read a paper on these things, opened a book, watched a video. It's all just what she thinks are correct answers to be said rather than actually evaluate the argument. Now, granted, I am not good at moral talk. I'll be the first to admit it is one of the most challengingly infuriating, frustrating things to try to read through because so many people use the term so many different ways you have right. to know what the hell the author is trying to get across because he's going to use the words differently than how one other author and you've experienced this right ocean i mean you agree that it's it's a it's really annoying right yeah objective morality when someone says objective morality there's about five or six different things that could mean and that's if you're being conservative with your essay. Same with subjective, though. Same thing. I mean, there's a lot to be said on subjectivity, too. Yeah, you see, for me, you can talk about divine command theory as subjective or objective, depending on yes, who's yeah. arguing 
the conversation. Because it's ethical subjectivism, yeah, it's ethical but subjectivism from the top down. Well. But it's What's it's right? ethical subjectivism from the top down, but from the bottom up, it's objective. Yeah, and that's kind of a difficult concept to wrap your head around. Yeah, not to mention. And I mean, that might not even be the case. I, I again, that's how I understand it. But if somebody who's an expert on this topic could explain it any different, I'm cool with that. But that's I, what I you just said, sir. I kind of that's how I kind of understand it too. I did note uh, as well that um, like you had people, two people that are very educated discussing morality, but neither one of them, neither one of them's expertise was on morality. Yes, which is fine. That's not really a problem, but. I do think that when it comes to who's the expert on the issue, Carrier has a stronger background in it. Yeah. Uh, just by the nature of having a degree in history, you need to have a lot of general knowledge and well, the fact that I've he's written on morality. So, yeah, have you read his blogs? Uh, I, morality? I've, uh, not on morality, no. I've, oh, I've read really some good. of his blogs on history. No, his blogs um, on morality are really, really good. He makes a good, strong case for objective morality. And that's why when I hear people say, well, right, was, objective morality doesn't to... exist, and then when you ask him for an argument, oh, it's just because. Oh, it's like, oh, shut right. up. I was listening to him make the argument that it seemed like it was up for objective morality, but it was like through a kind of a mixture between Kant and moral landscape. Yeah, he combines it a lot with like... Kantian ethics and uh, Sam Harris. Yeah, he drives yeah. a lot from both. Okay, so my my nose was on the right track. <laughs> okay, yeah, oh, there's no question, yeah. Uh, well, that's what I'm saying. He has yeah, two really I good blogs on are, it. I would recommend reading. He was reading. going evidential with morality, and I think that um, that you know he's just like positing well-being. But I think that the there's 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 again there's ways you can address what's being said that like SJ could have gone is odd on him, but she didn't. Like well, why didn't she do that? Again. She Okay, like, I'm sorry. I don't know. She could have gone is odd on him on him and, and gone down that route and then said that God is a solution for is odd and, and then made an argument for that. Christians do make an argument for that. Like they do that. But uh she did not do that. And I I don't know why she did not there's there's so many different like routes that she could have taken that would have resulted in a more robust conversation. The, the problem is But though, instead what we yeah. wound up with is Carrier talking about evidentialism and then asking the slavery question about Jesus and then SJ just falling apart and defaulting into cultural relativism and then also going into uh, just like non sequitur diatribes. The, pro and, and the problem, was, though, is right. that you've got when you when you're dealing with someone like SJ, I think Steve hit it on the head earlier when he said that the issue is that she doesn't want to be educated on these topics. The the reason that you know the avenues that that conversation can take is because you take the time to study it. She has not, if she has taken the time to study it, it has not been demonstrated. It's not an easy read. These are not easy. I mean, I'm telling you right now, these topics are not easy. No, like, over example, when, when, when we're talking about the is odd, I'm still wrapping my head around that. Even though I've had so many conversations with Dr. Malpass and Ozzy, it's difficult because like Richard, he was demonstrating an is odd, but he was using a hypothetical, right? And he was he doing had, a it was, it was simple positing. Like yeah. when you really break down what he was doing, he was positing well being. But that doesn't and show that there's a categorical imperative for some kind of no, no, well -being. it doesn't. What, 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 I mean, I I def, defer to Emoida as well. I think you know well being and and Emoida are, are hand in hand. I think that's what I mean by well being. But other people may not use that, right? how they define what well-being is and then they might even make it worse and you're talking about going down rabbit holes Cyrus when people start pulling in naturalistic fallacies of what is good that whole concept of what is good you could probably spend three years in college learning about because I don't understand and I've read more and I've read uh, you know the, the naturalistic fallacy which by the way Netflix free always gets wrong I've never met a CCP does it, that doesn't get the naturalistic fallacy wrong um, but they all do they, maybe one of them Oh, you're appealing to like nature. Just think naturalism is a fallacy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They do. <laughs> well, that, and that's one reason yeah, that's why. Um, well, that's one reason why. Uh, like, you've got someone like Matt Dillahunty, who's not a philosophical naturalist, but people st people keep trying to box him into that, even though he'll literally go, "But I am not," and here's why. And, he's, and I respect him for and that. He's though. said it so many freaking times. It's so frustrating. I respect him for that. I mean, you saw my argument. Um, and some one or two said, that, you know, the argument's really good. Perhaps minor, kind of trivial. 
and I agree with that, but I, I still think it needs to be pointed out. That's why I, I did the argument. But you agree that if you're a naturalistic or ontological um, naturalist, um, you cannot be a weak atheist. It just doesn't follow. No, it doesn't follow and, because at that point you're and, making right. at that point you're making the assertion that all that exists is the natural world, which means that any type of supernatural god need not apply. And as soon as you're doing that, you've now stepped out of the bubble of weak atheism. You've done it. Right. And so, <laughs> and so for him, or for any atheist to sit there and assert, well, I'm not making a claim, which he does, um, and then asserts ontological naturalism, that would be a, a problem. He would have a huge contradiction there. So at least he's consistent, right? Yeah. Um, I think I, I I don't maybe like his reasoning why he's an ontological not an ontological naturalist, but is consistent. But I'm not an ontological naturalist either. So. No, and when it when it comes to conversations like that, it's it's really frustrating to see to see certain people who will fall into those inconsistencies, especially when you've got someone like S.J. who's engaged in this conversation. Why are you grabbing my phone? Pants? Somebody said uh, Matt Dillahunty is a strong. I think Matt Dillahunty is a strong atheist too, but he never. It's hard to, to to get him to narrow down on that. He's he's actually always called himself a weak atheist. How much can he bench? He. <laughs> but, but you listen to his arguments, so sometimes I think he he does cross that line from weak to strong, he, and maybe not as intentional. He, but I think there's something to be said there. He might. Um, I think he, you can be a weak atheist or whatever, and out of, like out of these those terms are so weasel wordy in the first place. But you can you can be somebody who doesn't like hold the claim that no gods exist while still appreciating arguments for atheism and knowing how to present them. I completely agree. Absolutely, and I, I think that Dillahunty can is probably somebody who, from a technical perspective, as far as how he views himself, is probably somebody that falls into that. Camp. Okay, but if he says, and I don't I don't know if he's ever said this, so I'm not saying that he has but if he said something along the lines of hey look you know um, there are no gods boom you're done you're, you're no longer a weak atheist would you agree no but he's yeah. never but he has never i've, I I've listened, I've that, listened to almost all of his i've never heard, no. I've never he heard carefully him carefully avoids that yeah, yeah um, he's he sticks to the getting back to he sticks to colloquial a get, lot getting back to sj though like and i sorry so you're bringing up how long that she's been involved in this stuff um like the, it's not. It's for me. It's not just how long that she's been involved in this conversation, but it's how in depth. Like she's had in depth conversations. She's got access to people that have in depth understandings of this stuff. Yes. And it's like I've I've had back and forths with her uh, a couple of times, um, both vehemently disagreeing with her, and uh, agree like attempting to help her. Um, you know, in a in another in an argument against somebody we both disagree with for the same reason, you know, but uh, it's it's frustrating that with all of those interactions that she hasn't picked up on some of this stuff. She's an educated, she's smart. Yes. Oh, yeah. Like, I don't like. I oh, I don't I don't understand sometimes. Uh, when we when we have these conversations involving like when she gets into these debates, when she gets into these kind of corners, especially when there's a way out, because I, I I do think um, that there's a lot of points to her favor that she didn't bring up, uh, and I I don't know why that happens to her so much, um, and I wish it didn't. Like I I think that there's there's a lot of honestly. Um, there's times where I wish Heather was in the room in that conversation because I think that uh, Heather, as uh, as odd as her arguments can be, she is very she is, she is good at presenting like classical. Um, yeah, no, Heather's smart. Heather's really smart. I just don't like her conclusions. I don't think she. No, I don't, but she's good at making the arguments. Like she can yeah. go into like medieval Christendom arguments and and represent them well. Um, but she's not like. SJ, for some reason, gets is roadblocked somewhere along the line with that. Um, but yeah, it's, it's again like she could have gone is ought and then demonstrated that God is a is a bridge there, or like you can just as easily posit God as a bridge there with a justification for God, as you can to say to go an empirical route um, and say that you know well being is posited as uh, a basis for moral facts and that we can demonstrate what is therefore good for well-being but we don't have like the is ought problem there is going to be 
one way that she could have addressed this is to say that we don't have a reason to posit well-being as the answer, other than it, it seems that people like it. But I think there's, there's a, a reason lot of to posit it, though. Like. Do, do, do you think there's a reason to posit well-being? I think that's I'm a good talking about an argument that she could have made. I think that it's reasonable sure. to posit well-being. Like, you can hold that as an axiom, but I still think that the problem with it that the Christian is going to come along and say is, well, you're holding it as an axiom. Mm -hmm. uh, and, Why is uh, that a problem? It's just that, uh, you know, you the, the Christian is going to have a problem with it. I like, so it's it's hard for me to kind of go against this because I because I agree <laughs> with you, Steve. <laughs> but because uh, I'm not a Christian, like I'm like the polytheist version of image of morality is just so completely different from both Carrier and SJ's view. Like it's more similar to Carrier's view, but it's it's different from both of them. That I'm not going to have an easy time. Like, no, I get that. I get that. Yeah, but I there's think no, there's that no the, right or wrong answer here. These are that's what I I think. There's no right or wrong. So what I'm just trying to do is like that's just because you're an heir theorist. Somebody <laughs> exactly. like Heather or somebody somebody like um, Auchiwawa. Auchiwawa would have been fantastic for this conversation. Auchiwawa would have devastated. He's he's really good. Or yeah. MJ. Um, or MJ too. Isn't or MJ. who? The the um, he used to be uh, I can't pronounce his name but he used to be known as Slash he has a picture of a the ship like as a rem that is not exactly the oh the ship I, remember. I remember him yeah, yeah very smart he been. yeah um yeah I think that, that but a great setup for this would have been like of the Christians that I know Auchiwawa or um uh fucking Max Max would be good uh, yeah they both of them would have been much better than for this situation because they would have done the things that I'm talking about. But I've seen I've seen they Max would have gone lately. into these things. I, I don't know what's going on with Max. I've seen him lately try to argue things that I think is just not right. And our, and he's, he's, he's shit, but I've I I I, and I used to think he's obviously, you know He's gone off a conservative deep end. I think he's gone but, I, I've noticed it and I don't know why he's gone that route. I don't know. But yeah, yeah but that's that's mostly beside the point. But um I'm trying to like I it's <laughs> yeah, I'm, just, I'm just thinking like all the different I've been things. Talking that for a while. We're, we're keeping up, you know. So, so it's funny. I, I want to point out to everybody in the chat real quick, just just to get this out of the way. I recognize that the stream says that this is the abstinence-only education stream that was happening last time. If you refresh your page, thumbnail, title, and everything are updated and changed. I hit the live button before I updated the data on YouTube, and that was my mistake. I apologize for the bait and switch. And we yeah, can take you out and beat you. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to tar and feather me now? Yes. Kinky. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I see that a frustrated atheist managed to hop in. How's it going? Hey, what's going on, guys? Hey, frustrated I'm atheist. How frustrated are you today? <clears throat> oh, I'm pretty frustrated. I'm tired as hell, but I thought I'd come in and say hello, and there's probably going to be another stream. I'll jump in and say hi to everyone. But Well, I ideally, we're only going to be on air for maybe about an hour tops uh, with this one because I do have things that I need to do, but I think... I think that there was enough that was said during the conversation between SJ and Carrier that there are things people might want to vent and say. Yeah, I, I've, uh, I've, I've mostly vented. I didn't oh. get to watch it. I was too busy. The long my my things that my takeaways from it are basically that I'm frustrated with SJ's performance, and that there's many arguments that she could have brought up that she didn't. I'm and I'm curious as to and the carriers. Access. Oh, go on, sorry. Carrier's run with slavery was so fucking well done. <laughs> like I have to hats off to Carrier for that one. I I love I love GC and Shannon. You know that. I I think that that's they they could have pushed that more. The so slavery. Yeah, they, they let they they. No, they, I think that. Um, well, they could have pushed SJ to address it, but I think that right. Carrier did a fine job on his own. Oh, he did great. Oh, um, yeah. Without question. Like, I think that, honestly, I've seen people bring up slavery in the Bible. and Like, a million, like, you know, we've been around this scene. That argument's been brought up a million times. Carrier did it better than I've heard anybody else do it. And and that, I was impressed by that. Yeah, uh, no, I think he did a masterful job. And it, it brings up a really good point. You know, why are she using um, Jesus as this objective standard of morality when some of the major issues that are talked about all the time, as you said, is something that he didn't even address. You think he would have had forethought to address it 
so when we're talking about these issues, they're going to say, hey, you know, in the scripture, even Jesus said slavery is immoral. But like she said, what did, what did she do? She defaulted and appealed to relativism. Which does not support her position in the slightest at all, and it's it's really no, frustrating. It's, it's like it's like when somebody it's like when somebody when somebody tries to bring that up, and you, you have to think about okay, so we have we have Jesus who's a, who's a prophet who's directly connected to God. Let, let's say you're let's pretend that you're a Trinitarian. I know that not all Christians are Trinitarian, but let's pretend that they're a Trinitarian. So not only is Jesus directly connected to God, he is God. So this God is you know omniscient and has knowledge of all time in both A and B theory of time. So you've got a God who knows that at some point, culturally, we are going to address the issue of slavery. He doesn't think, you know, maybe slavery's just wrong. Let me just address that here on the Sermon of the Mount. He doesn't, and Carrier brought that up very, very yeah, succinctly. Give, give, give the guys in the future some heads up, you know? Yeah. Uh, and, and the, the, thing that, the thing that Carrier added to it that I thought was very good, and I, I, I appreciate this as, as a, a student of history as well, um, that he brought, he put it in the context that Jesus is somebody where this issue would have affected him. This issue was all around him. Yes, he saw it every day, likely. That he was, he was in Judea, on it. which was ruled by Rome. Rome had practiced slavery. It was practiced there. It's in the location. It's practiced by the locals and the rulers. Why didn't he say anything about it? If it's if it is an objective moral wrong. Now, some Christians you'll get, like G-Man, will bite the bullet on that and say, no, it's not wrong. Matt Dillahunty, you can be my a slave owner. way of practicing Christian. So what? The, the, one of the best episodes of Atheist Experience was, yes, Matt Dillahunty, you can be my slave owner, just don't tell me to do anything wrong. Is that G-Man? That was G-Man. <laughs> that was G-Man. He told Matt that he would that, gladly yeah. be have, his slave. I have a problem That's just... <laughs> God. Yeah, no. So... Like, yeah, G-Man will bite the bullet and say, yes, there's a moral way to practice slavery. And, uh, but, but a lot of Christians won't do that, right? Because they have a recognition that slavery has a, some, some kind of objective wrongness to it. But why doesn't Jesus say anything about it? Why isn't the Bible clear on it? it during the Civil War, there were arguments abound between the, the north and the south of churches. Churches split over this issue because the Bible is unclear on this. Also, um, so, we have a, a, a comment saying that if it's a question of slavery, then it's a question of going against the Roman Empire, which, you know, all cultures practice slavery in some form or fashion at that time. So it's not just about the Roman Empire. Uh, then it's, not, <laughs> it's not like Jesus didn't say things that were against the Roman yeah, Empire. He did. Um, but he's saying that if... Like, Jesus was regarded as a rebel... Like that, he's he was running around saying he was king. Like, <laughs> come on. <laughs> yeah, it's just saying that uh, the passage "render what is God, render to God what is God's, and render what is to Caesar Caesar's." That was specifically talking about taxes. That was not yeah. talking about slavery. Jesus was addressing taxes and how they should be handled and he was dealing with a group of people and addressing the Pharisees I believe at that point as well uh, but he was not talking about like a separation of church and state there the same way that we view it today and he was also definitely not talking about slavery in that passage it does it does not correlate it, it really doesn't so that I'm sorry that argument simply does not work right do you think it would have been made more sense if she would have said something along the lines of appeal to, to actually appeal to subjectivism and say, "Look, it, um, it's my belief this that that Jesus is the objective standard." So appeal to some kind of ethical subjectivism of divine command theory, and then say that she can get objective morality from that, rather than go or the route that she did with with relativism. Because I mean, if she at least answered, "Hey, yes, yeah, it's, it's my subjective opinion." She'd have to establish God first, and then establish that Jesus is related to him. Okay, well, like it, that, the, that's not, I mean, sure, but that's, I, I don't think it's a big deal. She's going to go divine command theory. She's got to establish the relationship between Jesus I think, and God. I think that's doable, but that's doable for a Christian. I think. Yeah, I think it is. Sure. I think it is as well. If you're willing but to I think falling into the trap of the here. Trinity, sure. Go ahead. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm <laughs> just saying that that's the route she would need to go. I'm, I'm she would have to invoke her own subjectivity. And I don't think she wants to do that, but she doesn't want. To, she doesn't want to have to realize that she has her own subjective viewpoints, even if, even objective morality that exists, you still have subjectivity as well. You still have your own beliefs of these things. I, I could, I could take an objective yeah. fact and say I don't believe it. 
I, this, some, a lot of Christians don't have a problem doing that. It's just admitting that humans are fallible. Oh. And I think it's and I think it's a, I think it's consistent. Yeah. And, it's, and that Rational. human that fallible humans can also like the fallibility of humanity can also apply to our like beliefs about God. There's a lot of Christians that hold that. And they use it to explain the you know variety of denominations. They try to get around the the interpretation argument using that one. They're just saying, "Well, look, we're we're a fallible vessel." Um, yeah, and at that point, at the I think the way that I've almost always heard that worded is "fallen man, fallen world" is usually the way that that's uh, portrayed. Right, and she could do that, but she didn't. And I, I there's <laughs> this is one of those things where it's like. There's so many routes that could have been gone to make this a more robust conversation. I think that Auchiwawa probably would have done that. Um, and talked about the fallibility of humans, about like, hey, you know, maybe I don't know specifically, but here's the argument. You know? Yeah. Um, uh, hey, guys. And that would have been stronger. But he just dropped. I think, I think frustrated <laughs> atheists had to hop out. That's fine, though. He seemed incredibly tired. Yeah. And no, I Eric Mishima just said that isn't all the, uh, theology incoherent. I would disagree with that. I don't find all theology incoherent. No, I mean, no, not at all. Like, I don't. Why? Why would it be incoherent? In, incoherent so, means that you cannot have all. When you say something that's incoherent, you're, then you're you're basically saying unable to be understood, which is similar to inconsistent. Like for example, if I say here's here's all my premises. They all cannot be true at once. I have an inconsistent logical system because to be consistent, all the properties have to be, be be able to be true at the same time. They don't have. To, I mean, they could be individually true and false, but they have to be at least the potential to have be true at all at the same time to have a consistently uh, consistent logical system. But coherent, the 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 the, 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 the well, see, the, the, coherence this is mainly just your ability to your ability to suss this, it out. If you if you well, this is, gets into colloquial versus more formal. Because coherent to me, the way I've always learned about coherency was to be, um, I hate to say able to be understood because that's intelligibility. Um, coherent to me is more of a, th when you have a theory that explains things. It's not contradictory. Together as a whole. It's holistic. That's how I would explain coherency. It's holistic. No, and I would, and I would agree with that. The, uh, the problem the problem with saying that all theism is incoherent is for one if there's if there's anybody or not all theism all theology rather not the same thing as all theism um, but all theology is incoherent if there's at least one person who understands it then on some level it wasn't incoherent and that claim falls apart just it immediately falls apart at there because you're saying theology incoherent not theism incoherent um, and I think there's a distinction that needs to be made there but the I'd object to that because you can hold that you can claim to understand something that is incoherent. Well, I'm not. Yes. I'm not saying. I'm not saying somebody who claims that. I'm not saying but, somebody it, but who not that. being a intelligible, unintelligible, and incoherent are two different things. Mm -hmm. Right? You can still have intelligibility in an incoherent thing. Yeah, it's just that all the premises of the the belief and the argument it needs to it needs to be consistent. Hey, Ocean, congratulations! You found the thing we object on. What do we remember? Remember, we disagree on something. Remember, oh, yeah, we were trying to figure out where the like where the fucking disagreement is between the two of us because we agree on so much yet we're like I'm a polytheist and he's an atheist, so there's a disagreement somewhere. We just don't know where it is. We've got to figure out where it is. But <laughs> <laughs> it's like congratulations, you found one. We found one, but I don't think that's the one I was thinking of. So no, that's not. We gotta one, we gotta figure out a little thing. bit more. Um. But no, I think I think dialing it back to the the issue with uh, the issue with uh, SJ and Carrier. I know that several times I've seen SJ post on Twitter uh, that apparently bio or evolution is no longer a factor in morality. But I'm, I'm fairly certain that so societal evolution is still a factor in morality. I don't know if that's actually been dropped yet. I think that she's talking about evolutionary psychology, which is. Um been regarded as at least messy at least messy uh, yeah it's like a, a lot of people discount it um but because it has like demonstrability issues mm -hmm. um but 
I don't think that you can say that evolution isn't a factor because we are dealing with evolved bodies. So evolution is going to be a factor at some point, because if, if yeah, it's to determine like, to determine morality in any sense, you have to first have uh, sapience, and sapience is a product of evolution. Right. So yeah, you know, it's some. Um, I think you're right there. <laughs> yeah, there's got to there's it's it's related. Um. But, I mean, you, if you want to hold that morality and evolution aren't related, you have to hold that there is a objective moral truth in the understanding that it is true in all times and all places separate from humanity. So that our, like, that the human element, there isn't a human element to morality, that there's just a truth to morality. Which at that point, if you but were to I say something that, like... I don't think that's a good position. If you were to say something a, like... That's a, a dangerous position. If you were to say, like, objective... Mer or, um murder is wrong under any and all like any and all circumstances murder is wrong which I, i'm sure she would hold that position because that you know is one of the ten commandments um but if you were to say murder is wrong and then you were also to say that morality exists outside of the human element then apparently all murder that is required for carnivorous animals to survive is wrong because the human element need not well, no, die. It's, so here's how christians get around that because christians do hold this position um, so murder is going to be unlawful killing. Okay. There is killing that is lawful. Like God commands war, yes. for example. Mm -hmm. So, um, killing that is, killing is only murder when it goes against God's law. So against law. You have an unjustified, yeah. right. If you have an unjustified killing that's within society, that's something that's generally seen among Christians as being murder. Whereas two soldiers going to battle um, would not be considered murder in that. They're not, yeah, they're not murderers there because here's, here's, there's a just war policy. As long as there's a just war policy behind them, so that you might hold that a Nazi soldier is a murderer, uh, whereas an American soldier is not in World War II because yeah. of the nature of the war. But, but that's a, that's a whole another conversation. What drives me kind of crazy is when you you start off with something like murder is wrong. And then an hour later, you're talking about every possible scenario. You know, what if this? What if that? And it, that gets bogged down into just myopic nonsense. Um, you could come up with an explanation for these weird hypotheticals. And it's fine to talk about a hypothetical. I do as well. But but you don't have to, to justify every possible contingent si situation to, to say something along the lines of objectively murder is wrong. Because you're talking about it um, as a whole, you're talking about murder as a whole is wrong. Are there, if you could come up with a scenario where you think murder is um, good, case you know, like you kill this person or I kill fifty billion people. Sure, there are exemptions, but I don't think those exemptions really distract from the fact that, given the initial conditions, murder could be considered to be objectively wrong. Fair, and I guess at that point, right, the whole I, issue is the definition of murder. Then. Yeah, I was I was just objecting to the whole like carnivorous thing. So the the idea the idea would be for this version of objective morality is I mean this is getting related to divine command theory that if um that there is an objective truth of the matter of what is what is right and what is wrong and that there's a source for that that it's grounded somewhere. And that's where we get into like the divine command theory. That's how it would be separate from evolution. That yeah, evolution the, then has no relation whatsoever that it's entirely dependent on God and furthermore that the reason why we've evolved this way to get to this point of having our understanding of morality is because of this goodness of, that's been defined in the universe already that it's that is grounded elsewhere that is completely outside of us uh, okay, but and you, that's why we know is because we're created in the image of God but you can look at it two different ways okay, obviously there's the evolutionary factor granted, I, I don't think even SJ you know, discounts that. But if you're going to suggest there's a, a deontological necessity that comes from some kind of deity of some sort, right? Then at that point, to me, it reminds me a lot of just a presuppositional type apologetic, because you're saying that in order for this yeah, to be that. wrong, I'm appealing to a being that knows what right and wrong actually is. And I, I find it very difficult 
to one even if that's the case how do we know how do we understand as finite beings what would be right or wrong as a infinite all-knowing all-powerful being would understand right or wrong it's so i i agree with you kind of like halfway kind of except that i i think that the distinction between that and presuppositionalism is that christians generally try and justify the deity as well and not just assume the deity uh, sure, sure, sure. I, I, so, I, okay, fine. One's a presupposition, supposition, the other might be a conclusion or something like that. Th that's fine. Right. I, like, I think the, that the there's a justification remains, that happens there. How do we know it's the it's case? It's assertion it's, either way. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're, you wind up with an assertion somewhere. I just don't think that you would, you, I don't, you don't find it in just asserting the deity, I don't think. Because a lot of times Christians will have arguments for saying, well, this being exists. And then they start to entail morality into that being. And there's, there's sometimes arguments for that, too. I, um, I would uh, reference Craig for that. But then you get into what... Let's do some arguments for that. But then you get into the exact question that Richard was Carrie was talking about. If you're going to do that, how do you how do you put that final linchpin in determining that 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 standard is being is the objective standard? You're just assuming so it we're, and saying that God is so, God. But that, doesn't, that doesn't put all the pieces together. The Christian argument would be then that because we're created in the image of God, that we innately know what is good and what is not good from that origin point. That, that because oh. because we're created in that, we do have innate knowledge. And this is where you get into Christians to start claiming you already know. Like this, this is to explain the reason why you know that like raping a baby is wrong or some shit like that. One of those ridiculous examples that they bring up. That sounds like, um, that yeah, sounds like, like an example that uh, I'm, I'm not going to say his name here because I don't want to talk about it, the uh, conversation that I had with him in, on, on here live. But I have heard that before where it's like, please explain to me why doing X thing to a child is wrong. And I'm like, um, okay, first off, <laughs> like that's, that's one of those things where like you start out that conversation angry. Yeah, well, that that actually gets back to Calvinism. Uh, John Calvin, he came up with this thing. Wow, called you got really Gitadops. close to who it was too. Weird. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, Do you have a conversation with John Calvin? No. Who, Calvin, but a Calvinist of some kind. We formed. A, was it uh, RCA or? Again, I'm not. If if you Christian got it, Paul if you got it right or wrong, <laughs> I'm um, not going to tell but you. Yeah, no, but, but I can see that because again, John Calvin, he came up with this thing called sensus divitatis, which is basically um, that the, the sense of the divine, and he used it to argue literally that nobody could ever be an atheist because they all have this innate sense that God exists. So therefore, it's ca it's a contradiction to say you don't believe in God when by sensus divitatis you do believe in God. And if I'm butchering that, sorry, um, I don't speak Latin, I just know the term. <laughs> um, <laughs> whatever. Um, but yeah, I yeah, definitely thought like Calvinists would, would, would do that. Hey, you're... you're, oh, you're no, it's not, it's not, but it's not just Calvinists that can do this. You can, you can go about that, uh, like, if you want to go with knowledge of God, then yeah, you're you're going to wind up as a Calvinist because it's that gets in, that entails like retro, reprobate yes, shit. Yes. But if you can go about it with morality and not be a Calvinist and still have it be an argument like that, that we're created and that we still like you can, that doesn't conflate with free will that you no. can know what is good and what is not good and still choose one or the other. Like that's the whole basis of time Baptist Protestantism. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, that, I don't that you, that at all. you know, and you're created in the image of God and that each choice that you make in your life, you know when you're sinning. You're perfectly yeah. fucking aware. Yeah, so you have the freedom to do it, but you have this a sense of awareness that what you're doing is wrong. Yes. Right. Yeah. By and, the way, uh, that, say hi to Adam in the live chat. Yeah, I see God. that he's in the, I see that he's in the hi, live Adam, chat. Hi, Adam. We love you. Well, actually, most most people hate you, but I like you, dude. <laughs> <laughs> I like Adam. I got, I've never had a problem with Adam. We get along fantastic. I don't know why anybody hates him so bad. Now I'm frustrated because I've convinced myself that I could have walked into the argument with Richard Carrier and done a better job than SJ defending Christianity. Probably. I think, I think what was it? Wasn't, yeah, wasn't the exact probably, thing definitely. you said that if you had walked in with SJ's arguments, you would have walked out of that conversation an atheist? Yes, I did. I, I told <laughs> Suris that. <laughs> that I, was, I was a little mad that if I'd watched this argument as a Christian, I might have converted to atheism. You know, apologetics is one is a, to me. Okay, here's the way I look at this, and and I want your guys' opinion on this. When I see the type of Christian apologetics that are out there now, that the ones that are they're in your face, the ones that we see most of the time on Twitter, the clown car policy, that kind of nonsense. Um, there's two things that are happening. One, 
that that type of apologetic tends to only keep people that believing believing and the ones that aren't even that intelligent but there are some f- bright people that do fall for that apologetics I get that but the flip side is that those apologetics convert a lot of people to atheism they really do I don't know how many of them convert an atheist or theist because I think it's pretty goddamn rare so it has two one of two effects either it keeps the believing believing or it converts them to atheism because I don't think their apologetics works to convert an atheist to theism very often. This kind of gets into a conversation that me and Ocean had. At, this is actually one of the conversations we had when we were at Waffle House. Um, we were talking about Dawkins and how Dawkins' uh, writing is essentially it's preaching to the choir writing. It's it's hype hype atheism is what I called it basically, and it's it's great. Yeah. Like Rich, Richard Dawkins is a wonderful author to read when you're already an atheist because it's it's arguments that are coming from your side, and you're like, yeah, I agree with that. But if you're not a the- if you're not an atheist, when you're reading Dawkins material, it's it's not going to resound with you. It, I've, no, I don't know about that. I've known some people that became, no, I, I do. I agree and disagree. And I, just don't think I, I, I I read it as a Christian. It didn't work. Yeah. I wound I up very it's, rarely. I actually read it shortly before I became a pagan. I very but, rarely hear people say that they they read Dawkins. Like I, I typically hear Hitchens is cited as one of the ones that get that can deconvert a lot better than Dawkins. Yeah. Well, Hitchens, Hitchens, Hitchens. I, Hitchens, I've heard that I've heard that about his book as well. But what, what the reason why I read Dawkins' book in the first place was because it was suggested to me by an atheist who had been converted by it. So I picked it up and read it, and I had all kinds of fucking objections to it as a Christian, and. Honestly, a lot of those objections I still I would still agree with, and um, it was shortly before I converted to paganism, so I was on the out to Christianity when I read this book. Yeah, and it still didn't work. Well, like I I, right? I was I I, like, I, I, I I was reading and I didn't finish it. Maybe I will one day. I I, I tried. I couldn't get through it. But I was reading a uh, a book called uh, The Case Against God by uh, George Smith. He wrote it back in like the early 70s, 74. and it's shit. It is just shit. It is taking Anthony's Flew's paper from 1972 and running with this presumption of atheism bullshit. Um, it's it's a really obviously an old book, but that has you that could people converted atheism for that. But the problem is, is now they have that book is what they think atheism is, and it's 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 shit. Like, like I said, I couldn't finish it. Maybe I'll try again to get through it. But the first half of it was just bad. It was bad reasoning, bad philosophy that I thought. Um, and I think, you know, obviously Smith is a, is a you know, brilliant person, but the argument that he used was just the same thing that Flew was using in Presumption of Atheism. So, But it converted a lot of people. A lot of people did, had read that book, and, it, you know, people, it was on people's list of bucket lists. Well, that's and I was the, like, yeah, you that's know, the same it, thing, though, is having theists that are that are very, very convinced by what we would pretty much all universally agree are just bad apologetics. Like there, there are some apologetics that are just not sound or valid, but people will still hold to them. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think that what happens is that people just latch on to things that they sound good, but they don't look too deep into them, and that's what happens when you run into all these newer atheists, or you run into these um, not really deep thinkers, and they just want the popcorn version of things. You know, when I hear some things like, oh, well, agnosticism deals with knowledge, um, I'm usually going to deal with somebody that just has popcorn knowledge of they've, things. They've pulled all of their arguments from memes at that point. They've gotten it from memes that they've gotten in a Facebook group of some kind. Right. And, like, if, if you want to do that, that's fine. The only thing is is that if you if you want to be the person who gets their information that way and then you want to engage in conversation, you're probably going to get manhandled. And the best part is, or the worst part, is that not only are you going to get manhandled, you're probably going to walk away from it thinking you didn't get manhandled. Oh, yeah, they, they definitely do. Like, I'll have somebody, you know, they'll just throw out there, like, oh, well, objective morality doesn't exist. Okay, fine, can you make an argument for that? Oh, well, it just doesn't. Okay, well, I'm moving on. Or, or um, they'll, they'll throw out... Um, Oh, what's this recent? Oh, like the whole agnostic atheism thing. Still, people. Oh, well, you, you know, agnostic atheism isn't is. You know, that's perfectly fine. Well, no, epistemically, no, don't it's need, not. No, I mean, you don't need to hyphenate it. First of all, like, like this is whole, this is the whole reason why. I, and I'm actually planning on finally making a fucking video on this topic because I'm tired of having the conversation. This is why I have the position that I'm philosophically agnostic, but colloquially an atheism because there is a fucking difference. There's a there is a there's a difference between a philosophical atheist 
and a f and a colloquial atheist, and I think people need to to recognize that. But if you're going to take all your information from memes, then you can't tell the difference because you've never studied any, right. any material. And and ha but when people, like I said, people can use anything they want, but are they are they rational to do so? And when I tell people, look at if you're a if you're a hard atheist, you believe there are no gods, and you want to call yourself agnostic atheist, there's nothing nonsensical about that. I think it's redundant. I think it's superfluous, but it's not nonsensical. Well, that's why I said that you don't need the hyphen. Like, it doesn't need to be a hyphenated term at that point. Well, it's not. It's not hyphenated. Agnostic atheist is two words. I've always, I've pretty much always seen it as agnostic dash atheist. Nah, no, no, I don't see it. I, I don't think I've ever seen it like that. Very rarely, maybe at best. But they're using, they're using the adjective. They're using agnostic as an adjective. That's fine. You, you can do that. I don't have a problem with that. But when you say I don't believe in God, and I'm not making a claim that gods don't exist, I'm a weak atheist, anything like that, and then you label yourself an agnostic atheist, that's nonsensical. That is epistemically just flawed from the get-go. Matt Dillahunty points it out. Anthony Magna Bosco now gets that. He actually removed agnostic atheist from his um, uh, profile because he, he, he looked at it objectively and he's like, shit, that's right. Who did so that? People, uh, Anthony Magna Bosco. Oh, that's interesting. He used he used to be he used to have uh, on his Twitter and YouTube he used to have agnostic atheist. But after talking to uh, uh, Matt Dillahunty, after talking to myself, and after talking to Ozzy, somewhere in that timeline, um, he removed it because I've talked to him about it before. But what does he what does he put there now? Just atheist. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, because because people because again people. I, I think people want, should want to be rational and when they're just putting forth a narrative because it sounds good and not arguing why it makes sense, that's not rational I want to I want to coin something real quick uh, and that's it is uh, one of the rules of the internet, which is McRae's law <laughs> that any, any you remember McRae's law? Any, any conversation with Steve McRae that lasts longer than 30 to 40 minutes is going to result in talking about the definition of atheism <laughs> I don't think we we talked about the definition of atheism. We just did. <laughs> no, we did it. There was no definitional things going on there. What planet are you living on? Uh, what the hell are you just denying that what just happened happened? That was not Get about definitions. Yes, it, yes. Nobody what? argued the definition of anything. What are you? We weren't arguing the definition, but we were discussing it. Well, not really even that. I didn't say my definition. In this. I think you. I think you're stretching uh, your ocean. There is Steve's it, law. Do you remember Steve's law? This, what is Steve's law? Uh, the amount of hope one left has, the amount of hope one left, should be the amount of hope one has left for humanity is inversely proportional to the amount of time one spends on YouTube or the internet <laughs> or, the, or the internet in its broadest application of the law. Steve's law. So, so speaking of speaking of Steve and definitely. I'm gonna change that. Hey, one sec, one sec, one sec. I'm gonna change. Is that presumptuous? Should I call it McCray's law? I just change that. Just McCray's call it to McCray's law. law. I'm going to call it McCray's yeah, Law. Fuck Steve's. Yeah, it's McCray's, Steve's law. <laughs> McCray's Law. McCray's Law is what's going to make it. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change that right now. Um, there, there's, one that, thing, that, there's one thing that I... McCray's Law should be that the, the longer a conversation about atheism happens, the, the uh, probability of it approaching an argument over the definition of atheism approaches one. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> it's like, what is it? Well, what is it? At an hour and 30 what? minutes, the, uh, the likelihood is now... I don't going to put a time on it. It's just the How longer it gets, the closer... It, it, more it will approach. But how's one. that not true with any conversation with atheism? I hear it all the time on other. Anytime somebody talks about atheism, they they they, they always say, "Well, you're the one is just lack of belief." It, yeah, like, you're you're, you're the known. one who's known for it within within the community. <laughs> you're the one. But I'm right, though, aren't I? I mean, so I mean, I'm not saying okay. that. That's, <laughs> going, that's so. Not, I would like. I right agree with you. You know, I agree with you, Steve. Yeah, I know you do because both of you are serious too. Because you're smart. I'm just making fun of you. Making fun of Steve is the best way to have fun on the internet. That's not my only argument. You know I have other arguments I put forth on Twitter. No, I know it's not your only okay. thing. But, it but is you got do you got to admit this. It causes a lot of drama. You know this. I love that. But do you know, do you got to remember this? Look, if you if you got to make your mark somehow, right? And anybody can go parrot shit that they pick up from sources. You got to admit, at least I do go out of my way, and I do read a lot. But you got to admit, I go out of my way to at least take what I read a little bit, reformulate a little bit, and come up with some try at least some type of original arguments. Do I not? Yeah, I mean that's why you've got a blog, and I think I think that's what's missing from a lot of people. I think that if you don't if you don't one um, want to put yourself out there for having original argument, then maybe you know 
being involved in the discussions in, in, in any kind of heavy kind of way, you're going to get creamed. You should at least try, right? My thing is make an argument. Just go for it and say, okay, can you evaluate this? And then people will rip it to shreds, but you go, okay, I learned why not to, to do that fallacy or or why my argument's bad. And in fact, I read something the other day in a very quick read, but basically it was something along the lines of people that argue more are more intelligent. And the more you argue, the better you get at it, right? Which it seems trivial, but there are it's, it's researched that when you, you learn from your mistakes in an argumentative type thing, you, you tend to be better. Even if you're just starting out, you throw you just make some kind of argument and don't be afraid of getting your shit pushed in. It's gonna happen. Oh yeah, I've been But I don't I've I've been still people that don't bother with that. I've been slaughtered in conversation online before, but you know what I typically did after I got slaughtered? I typically went home and I looked up the shit that I was wrong on on the Stanford Dictionary of, of Philosophy and I slammed my head into a wall for hours reading it. Can't, can't, can't go one conversation without mess messaging SCP. Now Shannon's triggered. <laughs> By the way, Ocean used to do the same thing to me. Ocean used to make me cry several years ago. <laughs> then I realized, Look, oh, Ocean's not exactly it. like... <laughs> right. <laughs> and I challenged him. <laughs> I would come in and wreck you. Yeah, you, 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 Ocean, you guys don't realize that Ocean was pretty, really good at, at just destroying people. Um, I mean, still is, but you, I've seen him really, really just annihilate people just from top to bottom. Yeah, I try not to do that very much anymore. I'm more about trying to be friendly and having You're more friendly mellow. conversations. I, th I think you but started I, to I, realize yeah. that one of oh, those two things is more productive. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's more like, so... How I see it is that there's, there's the, uh, there's the productive conversation, and then there's the gladiatorial conversation. <laughs> and sometimes one is so, sometimes like both of them have their place, both of them have their time. Uh, but I prefer the productive one. But the gladiatorial one is one that I I'm good at, but it, it doesn't need to happen all the time. No. no, I agree. I think there's time and place for both. You know, I really do. Hey, uh, Goddess Cranium, in the uh, live chat, are you, yep. you going to like invite anybody in? Or I've I've sent out I sent out to the Legion of Doom. I sent to Notja, frustrated Godless Cranium, and I posted on Twitter saying that if anybody wants to hop in to DM me in any way they want to. Okay. I mean, I've got the, the the invite is out there. I think that we've also covered the conversation pretty thoroughly at this point. Yeah, yeah. no, I'm that's what I'm saying. Like, There's other stuff to talk about. Um, the problem with it is, is that there's really not much to talk about there. No. That there's there's really two major things that happened. That uh, one is, you know, Carrier was, did very well presenting the slavery uh, objection to SJ, and SJ uh, got pinned. And there's a number of different arguments that she could have taken that she didn't, and we've discussed a lot of them. Also, Lucifer all and night, or not, not Lucifer, but uh, Reason Vision. SEP is the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. IEP is the Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy. Yeah, um, I was just typing that. So many people beat me to it. Gotcha. I like. Okay, here's the difference. SEP is more thorough, comprehensive, and much more difficult to read, but it's also peer reviewed. Um, most of it. I, I don't know if all of it, but a lot of them is. Um, an IEP is a lot more easier to read, but not as comprehensive. Yeah, my my advice to anybody who's wondering which one of those to start out with: cross reference them. Yeah, I like, do. That's what I just do. Cross, just cross-reference them. Don't don't stick to one or the other. Because believe me, if I had just read the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy when I was dealing with my Clifford's principle, principle video, I probably would have gouged my own eyes out. It's a very difficult read. <laughs> well, no, the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy is the objective standard of truth. Yeah, there uh, you go. And it's, oh, it's but, where I... It's truth? Uh, it's my ultimate reality. My <laughs> basis for my okay, ultimate Jordan. standard of reality. <laughs> What, what what is truth? What, what, what is tr what, even, what, <laughs> what, what is what, what reality? I don't even know how you would define that. That's how I should answer Darth Dawkins next time he brings it up. It's like, <laughs> really what is true. your what is your ultimate standard of reality? It's at Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. <laughs> <laughs> That's just also what it iron, is. iron Chair. The original discussion was on Godless Cranium's channel. It was on Heathen Hour on their podcast. So you can either catch it there on their channel, or you can catch it on their uh, everywhere where GC posts his podcast when he gets around to doing it. Did you put the link in the video description? I need to do that now. I've I didn't <gasps> enough. You're right. All those thirty-four people could go watch it, and they're not, you know, 
You know, you're right. You're right so, about that. So, to, to, Adam, you just said, when are you going to talk about the Legend Carrier S.J. Thomason stream? We, we already did. That was the beginning of the stream. We finished it. Yeah, that's, that's yeah, the thing. If you, wanna, if you want to hear us talk It'll about that stream, I think we can end the stream soon probably because we're, we're veering off topic now. Yeah. Because, But like, like I said, we've covered it pretty thoroughly. Only two major things happened. One was Carrier schooled S.J. Thomason and mainly on a slavery argument. And the other one is that S.J. Thomason could have made a lot of arguments that she did not and I'm, I personally, like as somebody who, who likes seeing the more robust conversations, am frustrated that it didn't happen. I, 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 I'm, I'm really curious if Adam agrees. a little bit about the reasons why that was that's the case. But because Adam, if you think that SJ did well on that, you're, you're just hosed. Fred says, "What about defining truth with MD's definition of what best comports with reality?" Don't you like? It is a definition. There, there's so much complexity when it comes to truth, right? Because you're dealing with things that one, you have to pick a theory of truth, right, whether you go by correspondence, which means there's some ontological fact that, that corresponds to the truth, right, for correspondence theory. But there's other types of theories where that's not the case. And there's also an, a huge amount of what's called truth makers that really are what makes something true, right? It, it, what is what is this thing that we are looking at to make this specific proposition true? And truth makers are complicated. Um, matter of fact, um, I've been reading about paraconsistent logic recently. And there's even one or two papers out there that's talking about how modus ponens may not be truth truth preserving. That doesn't mean it's illogical, because obviously it's a real inference. But that using paraconsistency, there are things out there that, to show that maybe modus ponens isn't always truth preserving using what's called gaps and glutes. Um, and it's confusing as hell, but I'm really having an interesting read on it. But it, it is, this whole thing about truth is so damn complicated. I think you could probably spend um, months learning about what they mean by truth and still not fully understand it. Because I've tried, and I still don't get it. No, it's it's an interesting conversation. What I've what I've found as far as the truth thing goes, and this is when I when I was because I'm planning on doing a uh, a video on pragmatism at some point soon for those who are listening and who are interested. Because I know that when when you guys voted, you said you wanted my channel to be an even split between philosophy and video responses. So since we're going to be going that route, the next major philosophy video is going to be on pragmatism. Um, pragmatism has a very interesting view on truth, and it's one that I don't hold to as somebody who kind of self identifies as a pragmatist. <laughs> well, I tell you, if you want to do, if you ever want to do a video on what's called truth value gaps, dude, it is a fascinating thing of what this, these they mean by a truth value gap. Um, but again, oh, Cirrus, hmm. go ahead. Oh no, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I just giving him an idea. Uh, like I said, look look into truth values and truth value gaps. It's very interesting. I plan famous person that was heavily heavily influenced by pragmatism is Barack Obama. Really. Yep. Huh. Very, very influenced by philosophical practice. I know that one of the original, uh, one of the things that interested me when I was doing my studies is one of the original founders uh, for pragmatism in the United States actually created, or not created, but actually wrote down the information for creating a logical processor years before logical processors were actually used in computers. And that, that just kind of struck me as like, <laughs> hmm, hmm, this sounds like my kind of guy. <laughs> um. And, and by the way, if anybody ever wants to make the argument that, that philosophy is useless, a pragmatist used pragmatism after founding it to make logical processors for the computers and phones you fucking use. So just please shove it. Sorry, I just, I just wanted to get that out there. Did Adam ever say whether... Well, I guess he didn't have a lot of time to listen to the beginning, so... Yeah. But do, do people like this? I mean, they really like um, listening to these types of... Um, just freestyle thoughts on some of these things? I mean, we had... I, I didn't announce this except for maybe 10 minutes before I posted it and we got 36 people watching, which is usually what I end up getting, even for the stuff that I do announce. So, I mean, hey, if people enjoy that, and and even after yeah, it was a baby switch, like I enjoy no, it. I think no, I do too. I, I do, and I miss... Ocean and I used to like do this every night. I mean, we would hang out yeah. and... and Good times. I mean, seriously, good times. And I know that other channels are doing a lot of stuff that you know we've been doing all along. Only, you know, I I, I was trying to do a lot of there was hangouts, and I, I kind of took over from like Nadia's thing to do these late night things. I can't do them late night anymore because roommates now. But um, a lot of people are asking me to stream more, and 
talk more about certain things with certain people. And I've tried. I get two or three hangouts a week in. But it's just difficult, especially when there's so many other channels out there. Um, and, I, and I like... I actually like going on other channels more than running my own hangouts because I, I don't feel like I... I like have to like moderate or shit when I'm. It's not my channel. No offense, you know. I can just let somebody else do it. That's fair. And I and I typically it's it's very because I haven't been doing this as long. I don't get as many trolls on my channel now. Don't get me wrong. Give me like three months and somebody's gonna make a liar out of me. Um, but I don't get as many trolls in my comment not my comment section, but in the uh, live stream. So there's not a ton of policing I have to do. Um, <laughs> no, 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 not in the live chat. I'm talking about in the hangout itself. I mean, you got. I mean, I, I, I right now I can mute and I go away anytime I want, and Fair. You, know, you know I can leave anytime I want. You know, I, I don't have to stick around. But when you're running a hangout, it's a little bit different. You can't, you can't just like, oh, I'm, I'm gonna, you know, leave the hangout. You can't yeah. do that when you're. Straight, so. I, I do say that there's there's one bit of value that I get out of hangouts like this, uh, especially for me is when I'm when I'm hosting something like this on my channel. Is there's a me that people usually see when they see the. Uh, when they see me behind the cartoon avatar, and then there's me when I'm live in a hangout, and I, I try to make sure that they're the same people, but it's not always the case. But having these live hangouts is a good way to portray that. But with that said, we are definitely sufficiently off topic enough to where I think we can end. We are, we've, we've beaten the two dead horses that were actually there for the conversation between S Chain Carrier into the dirt as best we could. I agree. Yep. Uh, so with that, said, I agree as well. So with that said, thank you all for coming out and <laughs> speaking. I know that we had a, we only had the four of us here for the little bit of time. Frustrated atheist was able to come out, but hey, I enjoyed the conversation and it was fun while we were able to have it. So with that said, I'm gonna hop off and go play video games. Thank you all for coming out.